God, thank you so much for today, um, just the opportunity to gather with your people, um, to together worship you through song, to engage in wrestling with your word. Um, I pray uh, we don't take this for granted. Um, it's a time when a lot of people do and think that it's not important, it doesn't have value, but ultimately, God, um, it's, it's all over your scripture and it's all over the effect throughout um, the entire walk of your people is that we we need each other, um, and we also need the constant reminder to walk with you. So I pray as uh, we engage in the Word this morning um, that we would have soft hearts to you, um, that you would clearly present who you are um, through your Word today, um, so much so that not only would we be convicted, but we'd walk forward in obedience as we leave here as well. We love you, we praise you, we trust you, we need you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. I don't know if you could sense Zach's nervousness. And he's like, we have a special guest preacher. It'll be great. There's a lot of hope in his eyes. I'm not. I'm sure it was filled with confidence. No. Um, we will be in Galatians chapter four, starting verse twenty-one, and we'll go through verse thirty-one. Um, we'll just be continuing through that trend. And while you're turning there. Um, have you guys ever eaten at Cracker Barrel? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. I'm not making some sort of offensive statement right now. Right? So Cracker Barrel, that is a weird place. Um, it's it's like someone's like, we want a restaurant themed after like a garage sale. Um, but like, you know, a garage sale where we also serve you food. I'm like, no, I'm not aware of that um, in existence. But because you, know, you walk through and there's like a, like a garage sale going on there. It seems like, and then you finally get your seated. Well, me and my brother, um, we did what all the kids do. Again, I've been, I feel like I've been to a lot of them in a lot of different places, and they're all pretty much exactly the same place. And we're like sitting there, like next to the tables, along where they walk in the back, there's like checkers. You all seen that? They like those giant checker things. And so, my brother being the older brother, um, he showed me through the ropes of how to play checkers. I already, I'd already learned how to play checkers. And I, I thought I was pretty solidly clear on the rules. And there was a, the occasional time where I'd be doing well against my brother and I would discover, lo and behold, there's a new rule that said I couldn't do that thing that, he, that I was doing to, to succeed. One of them being, if y'all, now I'm like getting detailed in the checkers, it's supposed to be a sermon. But I get all the way to the edge and I'm like, okay, my guy's safe. Um, and I should be fine. And my brother's like, oh, well, I can jump around him like this and take him, and that counts. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense at all. But he is my older brother, and he probably knows more about these things than I do. So I'm just going to kind of follow suit with that and do that. And then one day, um, we were visiting my cousins, and I was playing checkers against my cousin Greg, older than my brother, and I thought I was going to be really clever. He put his piece there, and I was like, I'm going to jump around him. Like, I learned I'm allowed to do it. And he's like, why are you cheating? You can't do that. That's cheating. I was really confused. <laughs> I was like, there's two competing ideologies here of older people than me that supposedly know more than I do. Um, and I was very confused and it put me in a position where I didn't know. I think, I think we've all probably been in a position where we're a younger sibling or a younger child just assuming that, that older child who we're looking up to has our best interest in mind and is not trying to trick us into losing at checkers or whatever it may be. Um, and I'm not sitting here judging my brother, I'm pretty sure I've done the same thing to other smaller children than me as well. Um, not my kids, I, I beat y'all parents too. But um, with that being said, um, the church in Galatia has had some baggage that they've been dealing with, which we've been going through. Um, they are a relatively young church, Paul helped plant this church, and he wasn't there as long as he was in some other places, and he had to go, and then, lo and behold, there were some other teachers that came in um, that were teaching them what sounded like some pretty solid things, probably, because they're like, we're, we're new to this, we don't want to screw this up, this Jesus guy has turned our world upside down and changed everything, we want to get it all right, and these guys, they've been a part of the people of God and following God for far longer than we have, and they're telling us this information. Paul didn't mention this, but we don't want to get this wrong. <laughs> we, want to, we want to get this right. 
And so they were learning some things that there's tradition, what God's people have done throughout the Mosaic Law and the outward appearance of things. And you do these things and you're going to be right with God. And they're like, okay. Um, one of them included circumcision, which we're now seeing the commitment that these people in this church had to wanting to get it right because I can't imagine if you're wavering on wanting to get that right, you'd make that decision to get circumcised. Um, but with that being said, they're put in quite a bit of confusion with these people that are coming in, claiming to have the best interest in heart, and also are like, we've been doing this much longer than you, so naturally you should follow suit with what we've said. But what we've discovered throughout the course of going through Galatians is Paul is not happy about that at all. Um, when he's writing to them, he, he uses some of the harshest language that I've seen. Now, again, a lot of times I've been in ministry long enough that I've known someone who's been like a Christian for like a year and a half or so. I'm probably not sitting there like, I can't, what, how foolish are you to do this? <laughs> like, who, who bewitched you? Like, what's going on? With all, like, like, what's wrong with you? That you're making these decisions and turning away from God. That just shows you again the severity of the problem, according to Paul. Like, Paul's not light on this issue either. Apparently, it's very foundationally clear that you are going against Jesus if you're pursuing this idea that they're teaching you. And so, it's been a complicated book, and he's gone through quite a bit of detail that we've gone through the whole uh, semester, or not semester, I'm, I'm thinking college students. Like, Paul starts off the book, he's defending himself and the gospel, his own experience with being a Jewish religious leader um, under some very credentialed people. Um, he was recognized by the apostles early on. He even opposed Peter in a, in a disagreement about this similar issue to this. And Peter, which we learn from Scripture, agreed with him. And so he's, he's really, his credential for this topic is quite high. Um, in terms of having this discussion. Um, and then he makes direct, ap direct appeals to them throughout the whole time. He, he cites three different places in the Old Testament, well, not just places, but three sections where he's talking about the Old Testament, a lot more than three places, that he's been citing and telling them, this has always been the case. I'm not telling you a new thing. I, I grew up in this. I was educated in this. I was gone through the whole experience of being a part of the people of God in education this way, and it's been all over the Old Testament. It's been all over God's law that this new covenant in Christ has been what we've been waiting for all along. And so, in chapter 3 it went through the Old Testament with stories about Abraham, and then later on in 3 it was going through Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Habakkuk. It was going through some interesting places. Lots of illustrations. So when we end up where we're at here, it's the final place is appealing to the Old Testament as the means of understanding that this, this is the, like what I taught you when I came here. I wasn't playing around. I wasn't trying to trick you. I don't need anything from you. This is the truth. And if you're wavering for it, like you said in chapter 1, if anyone were to preach a gospel to you other than what we've already preached, let him be accursed. Even if we do it. If we do it, let us be accursed. Because we didn't get it wrong the first time, and we're, we're, we're certainly not going to support getting it wrong the second time. And so, that's where we're at now, is he's going to a yet another appeal um, between Abraham's son, starting in chapter 4, verse 21 through 31. I'm going to go through it verse by verse. So it says, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? So of course, in their language, in our language, kind of in everyone's language, it's kind of a offensive way to say something. But if you want to do this thing, did you, did you even read it? <laughs> do you even know what you're talking about? You want to? Like, I feel like that happens all the time if you're scrolling through like Facebook. You see people. Ha everyone on Facebook is an expert on every single thing they're talking about on Facebook. And more often than not, you probably would. If you're in a conversation, and someone would say those things, you'd be like. Did you read a book on that or anything? Or you just, you came here as an expert on this topic really quickly. And so he uses the term law twice. So law can be interpreted both in the very specific sense and the actual legal legislation of everything. And it can be in the broader sense of the Torah and understanding the law as a whole. 
Um, and more or less, uh, Paul here is using the broader sense. Like, you want to be under the law. You want to know what God's people have been about since the beginning. Have you even read it? Do you even know what you're talking about? Coming into this decision making of you made you've made some pretty big decisions and in, in coming up to this point um, about trying to obey God's law. Have you read it? And again, I the reason I say this is not only to them then, but even to us now, especially when it comes to God. We make so many assertions and offer so many critiques while we ourselves haven't actually known what God has to say on most of the topics that we're experts on. Um, the, the response of the Galatians, what Paul is saying is, probably before jumping into a lot of these decisions, you probably should have done some, some reading first. Like go through the, the Word of God and engage what God has said about it, not what some teacher. Maybe, maybe These teachers were probably quite convincing. They might have been quite charismatic in the way that their approach was very great personalities, but none of that matters when compared to the Word of God. And Paul's making it clear, the decisions you're making, it's very clear, you haven't even read this. You don't, you don't know what's going on in it. And so, the warning to us from them then is still the same, is that we too make assertions and offer critiques while we ourselves don't actually know that much about the topic. And that's dangerous when it comes to God's Word. But let's keep going. Verse 22 and 23. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to the promise. Now, most of you, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, um, know the story of Hagar and Ishmael and, and Sarah and Isaac, right? God had told Abraham, through you, through your offspring, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed, and descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, sand in the sea. It's, and again, that's what's going to affect all the nations of the earth. And now, to this point, they are very old, and they have not had any children, and the notion of having children and descendants that match that description makes no sense. So instead, like most of us, when we are confronted with quite crazy concepts that, that are in line with God, we're like, how do I help this happen? Like, how do I make this happen? And they made that decision. Sarah was like, well, I have a much younger um, servant that you can take, and, and through that, that can be the offspring, that can count towards me. Now, to us, these are weird practices, but to an ancient culture, again, like, I definitely never would have thought of making that decision. I don't know of anyone in our culture that would think to make that decision. But offspring was a big deal to the average person, much less the person that God spoke to and made a covenant with that they're going to have descendants like this. So the average person in their situation is like, if you don't have kids, you don't, you don't have a full life. <laughs> you, you, have, you don't have an afterlife, really, to some extent, because they, they don't really have a developed viewpoint of that in, in, in this time frame. And so when they're sitting there worried, they, they, they probably are sitting there thinking, God has always intended for us to take this into our own hands and figure out how we're going to make this happen. And then we have Hagar and Ishmael. And when Ishmael is born and God eventually speaks to Abraham again, he's like, no, nope. <laughs> that's not what I said. I said, you're going to have a child. It's going to be with Sarah. And, and this is what's going to happen. And eventually... That does happen, and then there's quite a bit of conflict inside their household. Once Isaac, who is the child of the promise and not of them making the decisions on their own, um, there's a lot of conflict between these two, um, especially between Hagar. He was, she's looking disdainfully on Isaac, and, and most commentators and most people in history would assume that um, Hagar and Ishmael are looking with contempt very specifically on the covenant of God with Abraham through Isaac. Um, especially since by the fleshly understanding of the world, he's the firstborn. I'm the firstborn of my father. I'm the one who this is. God says no, so we mock it. Um, so yeah, so the birth, <laughs> again, so the birth of Ishmael was done through the efforts of trying to accomplish God's promises through human means. That's not the way, we're, like God doesn't instruct us on things because he's 
missing something that we're needed for. He does include us in the process of things, but he's the hero of the story. A lot of times when we're going through scripture, we like pick out some of our favorite people and our favorite heroes, but I don't know about you guys, like compared to fictional books that I've read in my life, where I have like hero type figures in the Bible, the heroes in the Bible have a lot bigger mistakes than they, they seem to always be making. And so I have a harder time being like, all right, I love David. He's awesome. He's a man after God's heart. It's, I can model all kinds of things after him. He, wait, he just committed adultery? Best case scenario? And then he murdered? He got that guy killed? It's kind of hard to get a poster for that guy. Like, <laughs> well, as far as my own ethical understanding of the situation. There. Now, I'm not saying that God isn't using these people, but the problem is the reality is there is only one hero in this book, <laughs> and it's God. And through him, and he's accomplishing his purposes, and he includes us in it, and we get to rejoice in it. But so, like, again, it might seem like I'm sitting here judging Abraham, but it turns out we are all Abraham in this situation. We hear what God wants to do through us, and we're like, How can I make it happen? And God is like, I never, I wasn't, I wasn't worried about that. If, you, if I had told you you needed to do something very specific, I'd have told you that. So, we must, so for us, again, to them then, with that situation to us now, we must hold fast to God's promises and not jump straight to our own methods to see them through. This is especially true um, for discipleship um, and, and building a community as Christians. It's like it's very necessary for us to see everything through the filter of God's promises, God's instruction, the way that He has set the parameters in our life. A lot of times when it comes to church and when it comes to Engaging and making disciples, we, we just kind of like, okay, I'm going to make this method. I'm going to make this work. I'm going to try to grow in a lot of different categories, but in the end, it's, it all falls short because we're not doing it according to what God wants us to do. So let's keep going in their situation. In verses 24 through 27, it says, Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one, who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now again, he's, Paul's getting pretty complicated for my pay grade a lot of times in situations, but I'm glad that he outright tells me he's doing an allegory here, because otherwise I'd have a hard time with some of these things. And so what an allegory is, it's a story of something being used to reveal a very specific and sometimes hidden truth in a conversation. And so what, what that means is every single detail about Ishmael and Isaac and all that doesn't necessarily correspond to every single detail of what's being said here. It's being used as an example. Like, we should, we should be able to understand it, and y'all probably understand it much faster than I do, but I, had a, like, I remember reading this when I was younger, um, going through Galatians, and then like, man, we got to, to that story with Abraham's sons, and I got real confused real fast, but... But him explaining that it's an allegory is really, it's not a full-on commentary of the Old Testament passage. But, so, he's equating two different things. Slavery and freedom. The earthly decision-making that came about, that brought about um, Ishmael, was a part of the earthly logic that leads to slavery. The earthly Jerusalem, according to this. And then it says, as opposed to the freedom that's found in the promise of God fulfilled by God as a part of this heavenly and, and free understanding society that God is, again, the, the Jerusalem from above. And this is interesting um, how engaged in bringing these non-Jewish Gentile believers into the conversation because he uses the term our mother. Because again, if you're going through these stories, Again, I'm, I'm not Jewish, and so I probably wouldn't have throughout antiquity described Abraham and Isaac and all these people as my patriarchs, like my family lineage in all these situations. 
But Paul is making sure, from a position, again, Paul's not ignorant to these things. Paul is a very well-educated Hebrew scholar who was so passionately against Christians until he met Jesus <laughs> that, I mean, again, he, he, he's very familiar with the situation, and if he, if he could jump to the situation of being like, there's a two-tiered Christianity. <laughs> the Hebrew Christian and then the Gentile Christian. And Paul's like, no, no. It's, it's our mother. Our mother. Because it's the mother of the promise. And what's happening here. And so, what's interesting is he quotes from Isaiah 54. It's a passage, again, um, it, it's one of the clearest, cool illustrations that like starts to bring in the world's understanding of what God's doing. Because before, like I said, having children was a big deal. And if you could not have kids, most people thought, oh, you're cursed by God. You can't have kids. And that's like, that's living. <laughs> that's living past yourself, too. And then you see the statement, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry loud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. And so, why does that make any sense? And in that particular passage, it's actually discussing how the suffering servant that, that God is setting forth into the world, which we know to be Jesus, who is coming and solving all these things. He's not just, he's not pitching his tent over just what already was there with, with Israel. It continues to say, oh, no, no, this tent, it's going over the whole world. <laughs> it's like... He's like, you're, you're picking up everything, and you're, you need a lot more fabric. You need a lot more distance to cover, because what's being included in this covenant isn't just, isn't just what you think you understand. It's going all over the world. How is that possible? And again, like I said, it's because of the suffering servant. The one who will startle all the nations, who will shut the mouths of kings, bears the griefs and the sorrows of his people, who is despised, who is pierced, who is led to the slaughter. And ultimately, he's the one who bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We know this to be Jesus, that through Christ, which again, that's what Paul, he's like, I met the guy. I'm convinced. <laughs> it's, it's like, whatever these guys came to tell you that you were missing, we were missing when, until we meet this guy. Like, that's what, that's what they've learned in Christ. And so, let's keep going. It, it, it'll, it'll make itself even clearer. So in 28 and 29, it says, Now you, brothers, Again, he goes right to the familiar term. There's, not, there's, no, there's no hierarchy for him here. <laughs> now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who, bore, who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also is now. So, this, so in this situation, I already discussed how Ishmael and Hagar weren't just like, oh, cool, Isaac's born. This was, they, were, they despised him. And they despised the covenant. And so much so that Sarah responded to Abraham as like, they need to go. They can't have any part of this. And now that's one of those passages, again, that, again, there might be people that have studied it way longer and way more intently than I have to discuss the ethics of whatever was going on in that situation. But allegorically, what I know in that situation is the world... The worldly view, the slavery view, this view that's happening is opposed to the free kingdom that's coming, the Jerusalem that's from above. And so there's not meant to be, there's not going to be a cordial discourse between those two thinking, like ways of thought. This side, the Ishmael side of the story, is not going to look at that side of the story and be like, oh, cool, you said you're following God, that's awesome, right? No. And that's why, again, like I said, these people haven't been Christians that long. They've had to deal with a bunch of teachers that are way more experienced than them and understanding these things. And Paul is still yelling at them because this is how important the situation is. He's like, this isn't a casual discussion, the earth versus heaven, flesh versus spirit. Like, this isn't a small discussion. This is as big a discussion as it gets, and you need to get it right. Because, and it's not surprising. They're going to, like, so these guys that are coming in, um, they've really set themselves up for a pretty sweet deal if it all worked out. Like, they've, like, they were not historically probably leaders of any Hebrew institution before that. They became, they took Christianity with Jewish traditions in a way that's going to get approved by the Jews, and they're leaders of something. They instantly injected themselves into a leader. So they're, 
most people, it's pretty clear that all false teaching in Scripture you see summed up is people promising hope and sensual things, things you can see, hear, feel, and touch, but they themselves are motivated by greed. And that's true of everyone. Like 99% of things that are being thrown at you to learn and understand in the world around us, that's in it. People are always trying to tell you something benevolently, as though they love you and are telling you something great, but they really just want something from you. Or, or they want to be in a place over you. And so again, that, that further fuels Paul, some of Paul's language in this book. Well, you, for example, one of the times he clearly mentions that they're like, they tell you to be circumcised. Well, I hope they go further. I hope they're emasculated. I'm like, that's, a, that's not usually what I hear in church as a discussion there. So, <laughs> um, and so Paul's pretty upset about this, but he equates it again with this story of Ishmael and his mother mocking the covenant of God and the subject of that being this child, Isaac. Um, and, and that's not meant to be taken lightly. And so that's true now. When you are a part of the work of God's spiritual fulfillment of His promises, those of the world will push back. And they'll push back hard. So what do we do? Let's go into the last part. But what does Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Again, the allegory, because again, um, that's one of those things complicated to see, taking a mother and her son out to die from their perspective is the right thing <laughs> to do. But again, as the allegory of the worldly mocking of God's covenant versus the falling in, into God's spiritual fulfillment of all His promises, we don't try to include this with what we're doing. Right? This thought has to die. Like, this, like God is not impartial to people trying to lead his people astray and lead his people to sin. Jesus even mentions that. Like people trying to lead you to sin, it'd be better <laughs> if, they were, if there was a heavy stone wrapped around their throne into the water. I can't imagine a lot of situations where that's better than something else. Um, but Jesus says that. And so... I thought what hey, why are you here? So Abraham casting out Hagar and Ishmael for the flourishing of the children of the promise. So in regards to the false teachers, Paul is saying, cast them out. You don't need to engage in civil discourse and harmony with people who are subtly or openly attacking Jesus. Now again, I don't mean that you're just going around like you're not a Christian, I'm going to punch you in the face. Like, that's not what I mean. What I mean is that doesn't get to be entertained in how you interpret scripture, how you interpret ethics, how you decide to walk about in this life the decisions you make whenever you're engaging the world around you. Because that happens all the time. I don't know about you guys, it's a lot like I, that, that Cracker Barrel discussion I mentioned with my brother, teaching me some interesting rules and checkers that happen to work for him at the moment. Right? We, I, I have an understanding from Scripture of ethics and morals and how to follow God and how to engage the world and love people. And then there's a lot of people on the side that are like, Oh, well, you've got loving people and everything wrong. Let me teach you how to do that right. And now I have a decision to make. I'm like, so maybe, maybe there are some people that are super credentialed, educated people in this world that have a vastly different opinion about these things than I do. But it doesn't trump Jesus. It doesn't trump anything that God has said and has revealed. Because whatever they may say or do, they, they didn't die for my sins. They didn't get buried very publicly and knowledgeably that everyone knows. And they didn't rise from the dead to prove everything that they were saying they were going to do. And so, I don't have to have an inclusion of the world in my pursuit of Christ. In fact, I'm supposed to do the opposite. I'm supposed to see the world and the things I'm engaged in dying, being buried. And that's, that's going away. It's like, I, my, everything about my life is of the earth. Like from my sinfulness to my nature and all those things. And, and Christ came to tell us, no, you've got to bury that. It's a seed. Something else is growing. And that's a good thing. But you gotta, and I'll show you. I'm, I'm getting buried. But what did he do? He got up. And he said that's the case for us also. So the warning for us today is twofold. 
are we also, so on one side, are we holding fellowship with false teaching and compromising Jesus? That's one side of the equation. So that might look a lot different for all different people. Sometimes it's not as intense as, yeah, I, got, I just got circumcised the other day because of this. Like, hopefully not what's happened to any of you in here. But it happens a lot more subtle in a lot of ways. Like I already talked about like loving your neighbor and engaging in like how to go, like let's say evangelizing the law. A lot of times that's, it's not usually a comforting notion in the world to be like, actually, I think you're going to hell. <laughs> and God is offered you this olive branch of freedom in Christ to know these things. Like a lot of times people don't like to hear that they might be wrong about something. And people will teach you to tell them they're wrong and that fashion is wrong. Even in that situation, if I agree with them, it's not a subtle agreement. I have just said, you're wrong, Jesus. This professor told me something different. Like, that's what I'm saying. And that's, I've decided to hitch up my faith with the world's ideology in there. So what would Paul say? Ah, you'll get it next time, God. No, he's like, who bewitched you? Why are you so foolish? He might, he might even be, I don't know what kind of aggressive language he is, but Galatians didn't hear it very nicely. Um, and so, you can't hold fellowship with false teaching. And if you don't know if you're holding fellowship with false teaching, again, get in the Word and know what, what God's saying about these things. Get in a community of believers where you can discuss these things. Grow in your walk with Christ. There's no reason not to. Like in engaging that. Often, ignorance, ignorance when it comes to Scripture isn't an excuse for anything. Because, especially in our culture, like, if I don't like this, like, this is a Bible, this, like, tiny thing. Like, I want a Bible that fits in my pocket. So I can find that. But I don't want it to be black. I want it to be pink for my daughter. I can find that. <laughs> I don't like the way this one sounds. I want another one the way it sounds a little different. You can find that here. And it's probably still a pretty good Bible. And so in the end, we have so, uh, such a plethora of options to know what God says about something. So ignorance isn't an option. And... If you just naturally assume that you haven't attached yourself to worldly ideology apart from Christ, that's not safe either. You have to reevaluate. We are, again, like I said, Scripture is, is inerrant in everything that it teaches to be true. Jonathan is not inerrant in everything I say. And so I need to constantly be reformed according to Scripture in the way that I'm going about my life. And so just because I discovered clear understandings of Scripture when I was 20, that doesn't mean that's when it stops. I keep engaging in God's Word as though He fully intends to keep teaching. So that's one side of it. The other side is, are we the false teacher? Are we the person bringing forth things that are, like, sometimes we're not, we're not always just innocent bystanders. Sometimes people inside of the church, especially, are a part of that crowd that's like, I'm here to educate y'all on what's right. <laughs> I'm here to tell you on everything that's ever been true about all these things. And often, it has nothing to do with the Scripture. Some of the best-selling authors in our culture it has nothing to do with Scripture. But they, they say they do. And many of us in here at times, it's, it's, it's important to reevaluate our own walk. Like, how, how have I been engaging the world around me? Do I find myself pitted against God in Scripture constantly or with other brothers and sisters in Christ simply because there's a certain preference according to the world that I like that they're not doing. And so I am actually over here attacking them and being like, yeah, what was you guys? I'm so sorry. Often we can find ourselves unknowingly being the false teacher. Um... So for them, the point of this passage, to them then, using the illustration of Hagar and Sarah, the false teachers are children in slavery. And to them, to the people of God that he's speaking to, they are children of freedom. Do not be enslaved by the blindness of the world. Like, I don't care how convincing the worldly leader who can't see and is blind tells me that red is blue. He doesn't know. I can't. He might have as convincing an argument as possible, but he's guessing in his blindness. Jesus sees. He is the seeing man and the seeing God and everything that we could ever possibly know. And so again, it starts 
humbly and passionately engaging Scripture, engaging a community of people so that we grow in the knowledge of Him and all of us. And so for them then, don't be enslaved to the blindness of the world. But for us all time, regardless of the new teachings of today in regards to freedom, don't throw aside Jesus. If, if something is requiring you in any capacity to throw aside Jesus in your pursuit of it, it's garbage. It's trash. It's worth. It's not going to last. It's not going to satisfy. It's not going to bring about any solution that, that you need in this life. And Paul, what we'll see in the coming weeks, he goes over the warnings and the realities of what's wrong with that. Like, what's wrong with this pursuit and why you need to throw aside... Like, to, to follow in the covenant fulfillment of following with Jesus, like, it's, it's something that's led in the Spirit, and you have to be in a part of with Him. And it's according to Scripture, and it's always been there according to Scripture. So, ultimately, for us, for all time, we can't attach ourselves to the world's understanding of what's right and wrong, and what's the best way to pursue discourse with everyone around us. Now, it doesn't mean I'm, as a Christian, going around like, like, I, hopefully this is clear and I was going around angrily attacking everyone. There's a lot of people that are angrily attacking one with the Bible that are also on the side of the book, like on the Ishmael side. But more often than not, some of the most solid leaders you'll find that are Christian leaders, especially with politics, you'll usually find both sides hating them quite a bit. <laughs> both sides of the political aisle will usually be like, yeah, this guy's the worst liberal I've ever seen. And then he goes and hangs out with the liberals. Yeah, this guy's a white supremacist. The worst guy I've ever seen. If, if, so usually that's, they're in a position that they're probably trying to follow Jesus and you're not finding a lot of support. In the world. And so be that way too. Courageously take the Bible, engage it, ingest it in your life, and courageously engage the world according to Scripture. But also be, be aware of where you're at, whether you've hitched yourself to false teachings or if you yourselves may have engaged in more false teaching than we love to do. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today, and I just pray um, your word is um, implanted itself in our mind and, and it stays the source of our meditation throughout the week. Um, but also, that you would throw aside anything that's of us, anything that we bring into these sort of topics and our insecurities and our struggles. And that we would soften our hearts to you, humbly walk to you in your word daily and in conversations with our brothers and sisters in Christ and learn how to, to love well, and learn how to argue well, learn how to, um, to engage each other shoulder to shoulder well, to prepare for a lot of things like false teaching in the world and how it, it's ravaging all the people around us all the time. And often many of our brothers and sisters in Christ as well. So I pray, Father, we'd all become desirous of you um, that we, we would start to see scripture as food that I needed to make. And we would pray as though I couldn't, couldn't go on without a conversation with you today. And that we would know that the, the life source of the gospel for the people around us is, is a life or death discussion. And that we wouldn't and take that lightly either. So we love you God. Uh, we praise you. And again, like a diseased part of our body that we learn to, to let you just go ahead and remove whatever it is that's holding us back in terms of false teaching and, and walking away from you. And so we love you so much, guys. And to Jesus, Amen. If you'd stand one more time and say,